What right do we have to make God out to be someone other than he really is in order to make people like him more? Honor God by declaring the truth about him. Jim Eliff. Pilgrims, the deeper our culture moves into godlessness, the more desperate the need becomes for truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for those who are willing to listen to the voice of God and acknowledge their need for a savior. However, it is also bad news, especially for those who choose to reject the kindness, mercy, and forgiveness of God in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. In this episode of the Pugnacious Pilgrim Podcast, we are challenged to embrace our calling as Christians to proclaim the truth of God's Word with boldness and confidence. Even as the gospel rightly offends, it does so in order to call people to repentance. The truth will sound like hate to those who hate the truth, but it is the truth nonetheless. And Christians must be equipped empowered and encouraged to speak the truth without regrets, encouraged by the words of the Apostle Paul, who said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Thanks again for joining us, pilgrims. Enjoy the podcast and stay pugnacious. In a culture with worldviews which once would have been considered inconceivable but are now considered honorable, a small voice cries out in the wilderness. A voice which is unwilling to surrender to the demands or the madness of the woke culture. This voice may be small, and yet it holds great power. Power that cannot be weighed on the scales of a godless culture, but power that will nonetheless stand the test of time, because it is the truth. Welcome, pilgrims, to the Pugnacious Pilgrim Podcast. We are glad you are here with us today, and we are hopeful that you will walk away informed, enriched, and equipped to live as pilgrims, in a brave new world. Well, pilgrims, uh, happy to have you here. Uh, happy 2023. I, that's where we find ourselves now, right? It's 2023, and that's that's pretty cool, man. Uh, that means a lot of things for me. Uh, you know, I was born in 1980, so that means uh, pretty soon here within a, a couple months. Um, I, well, I guess one month. I'm going to be 43 years old. Uh, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm reaching the halfway point of my life if I'm, if I'm blessed enough to live that long. And, uh, I think sometimes that makes me, you know, reflect back on, on life and, uh, you know, some of the things that, that, uh, I've accomplished, some of the things that I, uh, yet desire to accomplish and some of the things that I've done and wished I didn't. And, um, more than anything, just a lot of opportunities for me to look back and just say, you know, Lord, uh, you have had a lot of mercy on me uh, in my 42, 43 years of life. So uh, every time, you know, we we enter into a new year, a new season, uh, you know, it does give us an opportunity to uh, just really ask the question, you know, how am I using my life? Uh, you know, am I wasting it? Uh, am I living selfishly or am I Am I living in ways that honor Jesus and uh, make much of him? Uh, Ron uh, weighed in and said, hey, you're a youngster. I'm 67. And, uh, you know, I have good fond memories of not only Ron uh, as as I was growing up and spending some time with his sons, but, um, you know, just also reflecting on, you know, how he used his life back when I was growing up, you know, to encourage us to walk with the Lord and and to give us uh, places, uh, you know, a place to come and hang out and, um, you know, have an environment that was uh, God honoring. And so, 
we're grateful for you, Ron, and and you know you're 67, uh, but that doesn't mean that the Lord's done with you yet, right? As long as we have air in our lungs, uh, you know we have opportunities to live for the Lord, and so uh, I love when when men and women, uh, even at retirement age. Uh, are looking for ways that they can invest into uh, future generations and also use their life uh, to do more than uh, just collect social security and collect seashells on the seashore. So uh, God bless you, Ron. And, uh, you know, may God give you a vision for 2023 as well. And may you be faithful in walking that out. Uh, we're grateful for you. If if you're noticing something different, uh, obviously, <laughs> you see that there's no Michael here tonight, and we're sad about that. Um, you know, certainly as as he uh, has lived out his dream of climbing cell phone towers, uh, you know, it's come at a cost with us. You know, for us, I guess I should say. And part of that cost is just the simple fact that he he can't be here uh, regularly, and so we struggled. Uh, you know, really since probably maybe October or whenever he took the job to try and find some kind of consistent way that we could still continue to do the podcast and come at you and, uh, you know, join, uh, the conversation and continue to be consistent with that. And we just, we didn't find anything that really worked. And so, uh, instead of just punting down the road and, and hoping for something to pop up on its own, uh, I just made the decision to jump in and try and do this thing solo. And uh, it's not easy for me. Uh, I work better with a partner, um, mostly because I, I, I ramble incoherently uh, a lot. Uh, and just having the interaction with someone in the room always makes the conversation go a little bit better. And so, in lieu of having Mike in his orange chair tonight, which... I don't know. I guess uh, I could give you a, maybe a sneak peek of of what what that chair looks like. It's it's pretty sad right now, um, just because uh, yeah, Mike's not in it. Um, well, you know what? I I can't do it because it's going to screw up our audio stuff. But but just trust me when I say. Uh, it's lonely uh, here without Mike. Uh, but anyway, you're here, and and we're thankful for that. And so I guess the request from me tonight, even as we dive into the topic that we have going tonight, is that you would chime in with your questions, your comments. We always love to participate with you. We love when you guys uh, weigh in with your thoughts, uh, with your you know comments, with your questions even, even with your pushback. Uh, when things hit you that don't make sense, uh, we love having you guys be a part of this uh, podcast with us, and we're grateful for you. And so um, the reason that we stream live, uh, the reason that we decided to stream live was because we uh, had a desire to interact with you. Um, you know, the reality is that that we do what we do because we are continuing to grow in our knowledge and understanding of of the Bible, in our knowledge and understanding of what it means to, to walk the journey as Christians, uh, and we're hopeful that that you're growing in that as well. But one thing that Mike and I know uh, for sure is that as we walk the Christian journey, uh, we're better uh, having navigated it with uh, with others, right? Uh, we weren't created to walk the Christian life on our own. Uh, God has called us to not neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some, and and partially that's because. You know, when when we do things on our own, uh, when when we try to walk the journey on our own, um, we're cutting off uh, our ability to learn from others, uh, from their mistakes, from their successes, from from the wisdom that they've gained through through their uh, journey, and and we also uh, you know don't open ourselves up to the kind of accountability and admonishment that we need from others, and so uh, the whole point of this program. Uh, the whole point of this podcast is, you know, to equip Christians to look at the world and things happening uh, in the world from a Christian point of view. And certainly we all see things differently. We all see things a bit uniquely, and we all bring our own uh, personal bents and our own personal perspectives uh, to the conversation and and to to everything. And so, um, you know, Ron said, "Yeah, teaching others," and that's true. You know, we're we're always hopefully uh, learning uh, from one another and teaching one another, and that that's a portion of what it means to to walk this journey together. And so. Uh, please, as Ron is tonight, and we're thankful that he is, you know, weigh in with your thoughts, weigh in with your comments. Uh, we want this to be an interactive show, and it always goes a little bit better when it's not just one person rambling. 
uh, you know, some things, you know, just business uh, for those that might be joining for the first time or, or not really know exactly what the Pugnacious Pilgrim is, the podcast. You know, this is something that we do. Uh, our, our aim is to do it each and every week. And so we're going to, you know, whether Mike's here or not, the effort will be to, to put out a podcast once a week. Uh, and hopefully we'll have some special guests uh, like we have with Jake and Tom in the past. Uh, you know, to come in and, and fill Mike's chair when he's not able to be here or, or maybe even be here with Mike and I if Mike is able to be here. Uh, and so look forward to a podcast, a live podcast once a week. Uh, we also have something called the Pugnacious Pill. And these are smaller um kind of wisdom uh, nuggets uh, that we put out from time to time. Uh, some of it is, you know, really directed at, you know, events that are happening, uh, you know, current events, but trying to take a Christian perspective and, and equip us to, you know, to know what does the Bible say about that and how should I as a Christian respond? Um, you know, and, and some of what we're talking about tonight really uh, is going to line up well with, with what that looks like. You know, we, we have made a concerted effort to use our social media platform to engage the culture with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, what, what we have found, even in just the two years that we've been doing this program, uh, you know, this podcast, the, our first episode was actually inauguration uh, day uh, when President Biden was inaugurated into, into the office of the president. So uh, I think that was like January 20th, 2000 uh, and, or 2001. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see just how far the culture has shifted just even in those two years. And so, um, the, the point is, you know, if we're not equipped and if we're not engaging with these things as Christians, really the culture is, is a dramatic force that is moving very quickly. And I'm sure that you could reflect on, on that just in your own, uh, personal, uh, perspective and your own personal, you know, evaluation, just seeing how how far the culture has actually come uh, just in the last two years. And so um, these little nuggets that we give uh, at the Pugnacious Pill, they're supposed to be, uh, you know, pretty intentional, uh, pretty pugnacious. And that's that's kind of the point of the program is, you know, yes, we do push back a little bit sarcastically, uh, you know, but in a sense, it's to help, just to kind of wake us up. I think, you know, what we have discovered, Mike and myself, is that there is a easy believism kind of Christianity. There is a soft version of Christianity that, that kind of sells well to, you know, maybe the, those that, you know, they, they want to feel good. They want to find uh, the path of least resistance. They want to remain in their comfort zone. Um, but what we've seen uh, as a result, kind of the fruit of maybe the, the seeker sensitive uh, Christian message is that instead of building warriors that are ready to push back against the nonsense of the culture, um, you know, kind of what, what, what has been created out of that is sort of a soft Christianity. And, you know, I, I don't say that it, with judgment in my heart. I'm, I say that in judgment of what I see as the, as the fruits of that kind of ministry, but I don't have, you know, condemnation or, uh, you know, I, I'm not bitter or resentful. I'm just hopeful uh, that that uh, you know, part of what we can do each and every week is try to equip Christians to be bold, to be brave, to speak uh, truth, uh, obviously in love, but to do so with a boldness that wakes people up from their slumber. Uh, because the reality is, I think there's a lot of people that are willing to embrace. Uh, a kind of cultural Christianity, but not the kind of Christianity that pushes back against culture. And if if we don't have a gospel that penetrates the culture and and offends those who who hate, uh, you know, the things of God or the things that God represents because they run contrary to the evil that that they have embraced. If we don't have a gospel that pushes against that and offends that kind of mindset then to be honest, we don't really have a gospel that's worth anything at all. And, you know, I want to be careful when I say that, but I, I do believe that that's the truth. I do believe that, um, you know, the gospel is intended to offend sinners. It's supposed to. It's supposed to bring us to a place where we we get to the end of ourselves uh, and acknowledge that that we are sinners. We are, we are 
um, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God, and that uh, only through the finished work of Christ Jesus can any of us find freedom uh, from the condemnation that, that rests upon us, the wrath that rightly rests upon us because of our rebellion and sin. And so these nuggets uh, at the Pugnacious Pill are intended to push back against the culture, uh, to in t- intended to kind of wake Christians up, embolden us to stand firm on the truth that we know to be true about the gospel, and maybe even challenge uh, some of the things that we have chosen to believe because they're comfortable, uh, and ask the questions, does this really line up with Uh, God's word. And so uh, just a promotion there of the Pugnacious Pill. You can find all of this, uh, all these resources at our website. That's www.pugnaciouspilgrim.com. And uh, we've kind of said goodbye to the Wokeville Gazette, which was our kind of satire, uh, you know, uh, platform. Uh, There's a lot of other platforms out there doing a thorough job at Christian satire. And so instead of trying to compete with them or even, you know, maybe spend our energies to try and, you know, outdo them or, or, you know, we, we probably would just point you to like the Babylon Bee and say, check them out. They do, they do a good job. And uh, we've tried to, you know, uh, really hone in on our specific skill set and, and what we're good at and what we can do well. So uh, we love your feedback. If there's things that you found to be helpful from our website or our social media page, please uh, chime in. One of the best ways that you can help Mike and I out is simply liking our page, sharing our content, um, you know, subscribing to our YouTube channel, you know, uh, subscribing, uh, you know, to our, you know, becoming members of our, of our Facebook page. Uh, we have Patreon right now, but we haven't really figured out how we're trying to leverage that. Uh, you know, and certainly there is some minor cost to doing this ministry uh, week in and week out, but we've kind of absorbed that ourselves just as a way to be a blessing to you. But, but as we grow or try to expand our footprint, certainly having Patreon members and, and special content for you guys. Uh, is something that that we'd like to do, but we'd like to understand maybe what your needs are <clears throat> and what your desires are from this program too, so that we can shape it into something that we can all be proud of and and call our own. So uh, we consider you pilgrims, just like Mike and I are. We're all on this journey, and uh, we are so grateful to be walking it out together. So enough about business. Uh, I think we're going to shift gears here. And really, tonight's program is, um, you know, the episode is is geared towards looking uh, at the truth of God's word, and specifically the kind of truths that that I think would be hard for the culture to embrace, but necessary to speak. Uh, you know, the kind of uh, the kind of messages that that the culture needs to hear, even if they don't want to hear them. Uh, before we dive into that, we got a comment from Ron that said, that is true. Jesus said it will turn fathers against sons, mothers against daughters. What society believes is sin is fine. That gospel is old fashioned. God's word has never changed. Sin still is sin, no matter what society says. And that's true. And I think, you know, even even as it relates to the topic uh, today, you know, uh, there, there are... Um, you know, there is a culture that's willing to embrace the kind of Christianity that doesn't get in the way of what they're attempting to do with their own lives. Um, as soon as Christianity starts pushing back against what what has been normalized in culture, then your culture is going to have a problem with your Christianity. And I think, you know, one way to examine uh, the kind of witness that you are in the world is that if sinners or non-Christians are never getting upset with the things that you say as a Christian, uh, I wonder if they're really hearing the gospel from you. Uh, and and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to be a sensational here. I, I mean that, right? Like the gospel, as I said, should offend sinners. Uh, that's that's the way that I got saved is that as a sinner who was running my own hellbound race, when I came face to face with the truth of God's word, it was offensive to me. And, and only because of that offense was I able to really say, look, God has a problem with the things that I'm doing, and I better uh, either uh, acknowledge that and, and do something about it or uh, just reject it and rebel and, you know, pay the consequence later. But there's, there's no in-between where God is just going to make peace with, with sinners. Uh, the only peace that God makes with sinners is through the 
finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross on their behalf, and that only is for those who repent and put their faith and trust in Christ's finished work on their behalf. And, and first of all, they must recognize and acknowledge, I am a sinner. And I need Christ's salvation. And so uh, if our gospel message never offends, then I, I, I honestly think we should evaluate if we're really preaching the gospel at all. And so that's, that's kind of, you know, sets the stage for what we want to get into uh, tonight. And, and I, you know, if you've been paying attention to our social media uh, posts over the last, uh, really s- since the beginning of the, of the year, you know, we've been trying intentionally to, to put out posts uh, about truth that should be spoken by Christians or can be spoken by Christians without regrets, and so we just want to kind of go through some of the the highlights of these, um, talk them out, you know, together, uh, you know, share some feedback with one another if you guys, you know, choose to weigh in with us. Um, and, and really, I, I want this, uh, you know, as I look at 2023, you know, for me personally and for us as a ministry, as a, as a podcast, you know, as the Pugnacious Pilgrim, you know, part of what we aim to be is countercultural. Uh, we don't want to be liked by culture. We're not aiming to to be popular amongst the world. And we're certainly not willing to sacrifice truth uh, on the altar of popularity. And so uh, with that said, we, you know, the words that come out of our mouths, uh, you know, they belong to God. Uh, the things that we say are his. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean that we're always great advocates or we're always great ambassadors, but our aim is that God would use the words that come out of our mouth to reach the lost with his truth and with his love and with his gospel. And so truth without regrets simply just means that we're going to say the truth. And we're not going to feel bad about telling the truth. We're not going to feel ashamed. We're not going to be embarrassed. We are not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power unto salvation. That's what God's word tells us. And so really, when we talk about truth without regrets, it's saying just be truthful, be bold, be courageous, share the truth, use the platforms and the words and the time and the, the resources that God has given to you to prophetize. Uh, because there is a broken world out there. As we always say, there, there's a lost world out there, um, and, and they desperately need to hear the truth from us. And so, you know, we kind of want to get into some of these comments that we've made uh, on our socials and, and you know, kind of suss it out a little bit, and uh, hopefully you'll see more and more of these as we go forward. Uh, the first one, uh, a man is free to believe whatever he chooses, He's free to live as he pleases. He is free to reject God and his word and pursue his own ideas of life, liberty, and happiness. However, what a man isn't free from is the truth. It is appointed for man to die once and then face judgment, Hebrews 9.27. Every man, regardless of his religion, his faith, or lack thereof, will stand before God on judgment day and give an account for his life. That judgment will not be subjective. It will be judgment in light of God's character, which is grounded in the truth God has revealed to us in his word. Though God may allow a man to spend his entire life rejecting this truth as he chooses to live for his own pleasures and purposes, man cannot evade the judgment of God. It is coming, and the only means of escape is to repent, turn to God, and receive his gift of salvation through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's our first truth nugget, uh, the first truth that we want to share without regrets. And, and I think, you know, uh, we, we live in this culture, in this society that says, you know, you do you, essentially, right? And, you know, one problem with that is is just the simple fact that you do you actually is what got us into this mess in in the first place. Um, you know, you do you is what got Adam and Eve into the predicament that that has affected every single man that's been born, uh, every single man, woman, child that has been born since Adam and Eve. Uh, and that is the simple fact that they rejected what God called good and embraced what they thought was going to be for their better good, uh, which indeed turned out to be uh, the catastrophe, which we now know as sin. 
And so, you know, we, we can pretend like, you know, if, if everybody just does what works for them, that, that we can all just get along. And, and the reality is maybe, you know, here on earth, you know, we may have semblances of peace, but in all honesty, the only peace that actually matters is the peace that man has with God. And I think, you know, one other thing that I'd like to say on that, you know, subject by itself is that, you know, there might be contrived peace, but we we know that that sin always seeks to devour and destroy. And so, you know, we, we can look at, you know, some of the things that the culture, you know, is promoting currently, at least here in America, uh, you know, a lot of the, the transgender stuff and, you know, the gender ideologies and and you know even the the wokeism like things that would kind of fall into that category all these things i think are done uh with with the intention of trying to bring peace right but but like we see in scripture unless peace is granted uh through god's work uh in and through god's people and restoring people to himself that peace does not last and so, you know, we see that just in how these things play out, right? Where we're told that we need to be tolerant of all these things, right? But those that are telling us that we need to be tolerant are actually some of the most intolerant people that you're going to find because they themselves will not tolerate things that don't line up with their own ideologies. And so you can't contrive people peace, you know, there, there is no K sera sera or whatever, you know, whatever will be, will be right. Like, you know, there, there's just this, this idea that somehow we can fabricate peace and that, that we'll all be able to live kumbaya happy ever after. But we know the truth when we read God's word is that the only kind of peace that, that is sustaining, the only kind of peace that actually is peace is the kind, is the kind of peace that God can produce. Uh, as a fruit of the spirit, and so you know that that's one truth nugget that that we kind of put out there, and and just wanted to assess it out that you know y- you know we can pretend uh, you know with the world that that you know uh, life just goes on and everybody gets to choose their own adventure. But the truth of God's word is that regardless if you uh, submit to God, believe in God, or reject God, uh, you will one day stand before God and give an account for how you chose to use the life that he gave to you. And, you know, on Judgment Day, which is coming for all of us, regardless if we like it or not, on Judgment Day, we will stand before God and God will either say, well done, you good and faithful servant, or... Uh, you know, which will be the case uh, for many, he will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. And so that that should be a uh, something that wakes us up uh, as people. That should be something that B, uh, you know, encourages Christians to use their life. You know, if you know people, and we all do, we all have people that we work with, that, that are family, that are friends, you know, that we engage with regularly who simply reject God's truth. And we can't just simply make peace with, well, I'm just going to enjoy this friendship for what it is right now. And, you know, whatever happens in eternity happens in eternity. Like, that's unfair. <laughs> like, God is literally trying to make his appeal to the world through you. And you owe it to not only your your God, your Savior, to be his ambassador, but you owe it to your family and your friends and those whom you say you love to tell them the truth about God's word. And so that's the encouragement there. Uh, Ron weighed in and said, uh, true, the LGBT, the LBGTQ uh, will never admit they are bigoted against straight people. And, you know, and that's true. I, I just posted something, you know, a little bit earlier tonight that that said, you know, uh, uh, you know, trans people um, can call those who don't uh, engage or those that don't uh, celebrate um, transgenderism and all the, the gender nonsense, you know, it's, it's okay for them to call those people evil, bigoted, transphobes, right? But, uh, you know, heaven help uh, all of us if we, you know, happen to use the wrong pronoun to address, you know, a man when he proclaims to be a woman. I think I was just reading yesterday that uh, in Canada, uh, who is it, Jordan Peterson or whatever, like, they basically uh, said that if he wants to remain a psychologist in Canada, he's going to have to go through re-education sensitivity training uh, because he dead named somebody. I guess he dead named uh, Ellen Page. Uh, she's no longer a woman uh, in her mind. She's now a man. And so, 
you know, because of that, she, you know, she must be referred to as a man. And for anyone who refuses to call her a man, especially Jordan Peterson, you know, uh, Canada's trying to strip him of his, uh, essentially his credentials as a psychologist uh, because he isn't uh, walking or towing the line that culture has determined is the only right path. So uh, there's a lot of intolerance <laughs> amongst the tolerant crowd. Uh, okay, uh, moving on uh, to our second uh, item or our second uh, post here about truth without regrets. Uh, it says this, the fire of God's righteous wrath towards sinners burns just as hot as the fire of his love for sinners. The Lord is just and he will hold so- sinners accountable for their rebellion against him. However, he is merciful and slow to anger as he patiently waits for sinners to repent and seek refuge in the, in the finished work of Jesus Christ on their behalf. And, you know, why is this a truth that needs to be shared without regret? Well, because, uh, like we uh, alluded to, or like I alluded to before, you know, there are, there are Christians, there are churches, there are, there are Christian platforms that will spend all of their time and energy and effort talking about how hot God's love burns for people. And I don't disagree with that at all. You know, the Bible is clear. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We, we know what John 3.16 says, right? We know that. Um, so we know that God does love the world. Uh, the problem is that it's not just love that burns uh, hot for God. It is also his righteous judgment. It is also his his wrath that burns rightly, okay? And so God is a righteous judge. And so we must understand that his wrath towards sinners, you know, the the Bible says clearly that before we were saved, we were children of wrath. And, And our sin deserves God's wrath. Our sin deserves God's punishment. Our rebellion against God deserves his righteous uh, punishment, uh, and and God's righteous wrath towards sinners burns hot, and so it is equally important for us to speak of the quote unquote bad news of the gospel. I, I don't know that the, that the you know that telling sinners that they're sinners is really bad news. I think it's good news, right? I think deep down we all know that we have fallen short of God's glory. Uh, I think we live under the weight and the burden uh, of of not being able to to uh, quench God's uh, wrath, right? Like we, we can't do that on our own. Um, and so it is good news, in my opinion, when, when sinners can hear God's word, tell them you're sinners, you've fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So that sweet, sweet good news of the gospel only makes sense when we understand the weight of our sin and the reality of what our sin means for us. And so the truth that we desire for people to know and the truth that we desire for Christians to share without regret is that the wages of sin is death and that God will uh, will judge every man uh, for his actions, and without Christ's work covering, uh, you know, their sin, they will have to pay for their sin on their own, and and the penalty for sin is death. And so, you know, the the encouragement, pilgrims, is speak the truth. Certainly, do it in love. You know, the 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 two can't be divorced from one another. God's wrath is burning hot. But God's love for people is burning hot too. And those things are are equally important for us to preach as our gospel message when, when we reach out into the world. We got some comments. Um, Thomas uh, weighed in and said, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's from uh, 1 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. And that's so true. 
God has made a promise. And, and one of the greatest privileges that we have as people is that God is patient, that God is merciful, that God is long suffering. Uh, he, he is just and his justice will uh, be pure. His justice will be righteous and his justice will be severe on sinners. I mean, that that's what scripture tells us. But we have time right now. We have breath in our lungs. We have life in our bodies that, that we have an opportunity right now in this moment to repent and to, to acknowledge God without you, I am hellbound. And, and without your finished work on my behalf, I know that I have hell to pay. And so God's love compels God's uh, long suffering and mercy, even though God's justice will get the final say and, and it'll be a beautiful thing. Uh, Ron weighed in and said, I am a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other God before me. That that's the first commandment. And that's true, right? Is that, that our idols or, or whatever gods that we have elevated in our life, uh, sometimes it's just straight up ourselves, right? Uh, sitting on the throne, um, God is jealous and, and he will have no other gods before us. And so, um, that, that is a command and, uh, you know, we will be held accountable for that. Um, Ron also said, look at God's punishment of the Israelites that built the golden calf. And that's true. Um, you know, I mean, ground, ground it up and, and sprinkle it on your Cheerios in the morning and eat it right. Like that, that's God, God's fire burned hot. But even in that moment, though there, his punishment, you know, was severe, uh, he spared some, uh, and, and he continues to spare some for the fame and glory of his own name. Uh, we're going to move on to another uh, truth nugget here, a truth without regret, and that is belief in Jesus without the acknowledgement, repentance, and rejection of sin isn't faith. It's foolishness. Christ didn't die to set you free to live like hell. He died to set you free to live for Christ. And that's something that I think Christians need to hear. I mean, certainly the world needs to hear that. But for those that profess Christ and yet their life looks no different today than it did before uh, they profess Christ, you know, we know that Scripture tells us he who began a good work in you will uh, will finish that work uh, on, on the day of salvation. And, and so what we need to understand is that we should be growing in holiness. There should be marks in our lives that are evidence of the spiritual fruit that is being um, you know, kind of cultivated within us and and sprouting out and and coming from us. And so those fruits are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, uh, self-control. Th- those are the kind of fruits that should be born in us. And I think, you know, it, it's, you know, I've seen a lot of people out on the street or or even as as I talk to Christians that, that I come into contact with and ask them, well, well, how do you know that you're saved? You know, and, and well, because I believe in Jesus. Well, well, what does that mean, right? What does it mean that you believe in Jesus? I mean, even the demons believe in Jesus. They, they talk to him, right? Uh, when, when he was casting them out or was about to cast them out and they requested to be cast into the pigs, I mean, they knew what Jesus came to do. They knew who he was, right? And so, you know, just acknowledging that Jesus existed, uh, even acknowledging that Jesus is a Savior, uh, that that's not sufficient. Uh, it's not just simply about uh, belief, right? Uh, it's belief uh, in the fact that Christ died on my behalf to pay for the sins uh, that I have committed, but it's also an acknowledgement of the sin and then a choice to repent from that sin, which literally means to turn away from that sin, to to walk in a separate direction than that sin, and you know to uh, to walk towards Christ uh, and and seek. Uh, his kingdom and his righteousness and and trust that he will uh you know he who began the good work in us will will uh you know lead us to the kind of sanctification that he has promised us in scripture and so to to just continue to live uh, as if the choices that we make don't matter, that, that, you know, we have some kind of fire insurance and that's good enough. I mean, that is not faith. I uh, like, like the post said, it's foolishness. Uh, Christ did not die to set us free to live like hell. He died to set us free to live 
like Christ. Uh, Ron weighed in and said the Muslims believe in Jesus. They do. They believe that he was a prophet, uh, so they don't believe necessarily in uh, him. Well, I know for sure that they don't believe that he is God uh, because in their mind, you know, God a can't die and b is god the father only right and so uh the tenet of the christian faith is that god is both fa- or is father son and holy spirit is a triune god uh you know the trinity uh and yet you know muslims just believe that jesus was a prophet and they don't even think he was the greatest prophet they believe muhammad was the greatest prophet uh and muslims also don't believe that jesus died they believe that he was uh you know that he was spared a death, uh, I believe. You, you correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I certainly am not, uh, you know, the most knowledgeable on on the tenets of the Muslim faith. But uh, you know, believing in Jesus, uh, you know, is is not uh, just a simple thing, right? Like like Acts tells us, believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Yes. That, that is absolutely true, but what does it mean to believe on the Lord Jesus, to believe what he's done, to believe why he did what he did uh, and why he needed to, and then also to believe that if we put our faith and trust in him and repent as John the Baptist called us to, right, repent and believe, uh, then then God is faithful to lead us not only unto salvation, uh, which happens at the moment of justification, but also uh, to sanctification as we grow in holiness so that we, like Peter, uh, can say, be holy as he is holy. Uh, I'm loving the comments. Keep them coming, guys. We appreciate that so much. Uh, You know, another thing, uh, truth without regrets, uh, the only God I want to bless America is the God of Scripture. And the only blessing I desire from this God is the kind of blessings which line up with his Scripture, namely the kind of blessings that lead a people and a nation to repent of their sin and turn to him. Uh, You know, I I, I think... in America specifically, and this is really the only context that I can speak of uh, specifically, I, I did live in Italy for about three years. And though Italians have a love for their country, uh, the part of Italy that I lived in was uh, southern Italy, Naples. And they were overtaken by so many different uh, people throughout their history that literally their loyalty to their country was was pretty uh, it was pretty fragile, it, you know, at best. I mean, they were loyal to their soccer teams. Uh, they were loyal to, you know, uh, maybe their local communities and such. But to have a loyalty and a love for their country, uh, so to speak, you know, that that didn't run very deep. But but in America, this this idea of God bless America, right? I mean, that's a big deal for us, right? And I think some of that uh, probably is connected deeply to, you know, the kind of Christian foundation that we actually have as a nation, the kind of Christian foundation that that many in the culture today want us to not only reject, but but deny that it ever existed. Um, But one thing that I think needs to be said clearly, especially by Christians, is that we don't want God to bless America uh, simply with uh, prosperity, right? I I think Ron weighed in a little bit earlier. I'm going to see if I can find it. Um, he said, uh, how do you say that? You're not trying to be prosperity preaching. Jesus has never been a genie in a bottle. We as Christians cannot ask for whatever we desire and believe that you will get. You know, that that's kind of the point, right? We, we say all the time, God bless America, but what do we mean by that, right? And and what does blessing actually look like, right? Because if if God gave us financial blessing, if God gave us a stock market that, that just soared uh, back to the place that it was uh, before uh, Build Back Better became a thing, um, you know, if God gave every person 30 Bitcoins and all of a sudden it was worth $60,000 each, w- would we truly be blessed? And I think the answer that we can clearly see, you know, even from Scripture, right? Like God warned Israel, I'm going to take you to the promised land. I'm going to lead you there. He, he, sh- he tells us in Deuteronomy, I think either chapter 6 or 8, but he, he says, you know, I'm going to lead you to this place, but be careful. Because when you have your cows and you have your herds and you have your, uh, you know, you have your own kingdom and you have your your own um, promised land, uh, be careful not to forget me. 
And I, I think as God's blessing comes on a nation, the tendencies oftentimes uh, are for people to just live in prosperity and forget where, where those blessings actually even came from. And so the point being made is that you know, the only kind of blessing that I want from God uh, is the God of Scripture, and the only blessing that I devi- desire from the God of Scripture is the kind of blessings that will lead us as a people and as a nation to repentance. Uh, if, if we look at, at our culture specifically and the things that we're pressing f- towards, the things that we're walking towards, the things that we're teaching the next generation, the kind of things that we're celebrating, the kind of parades that we're having in the streets of our country, uh, the kind of protests that we're having in the streets of our country, it's very clear to me that these things do not line up with what God calls good. And so I desire for God to bless America, but I desire for God to bless America in the form of his discipline that is loving, in the form of his uh, uh, discipline that leads a people to brokenness and repentance, and ultimately that leads them back or even to him uh, so that he can truly uh, restore uh, a people to himself and that hopefully uh, you know, as a nation, we can be humbled so that we can be a blessing not only to to the next generation of Americans, but also to the world. Uh, there was a time when American Christianity uh, was was the kind of Christianity that went out into the world and made disciples. And and what we're seeing now is that there's a lot of countries that are you know sending missionaries to America because America is a fertile. Uh, grounds for for sharing the gospel and and to me uh, I'm glad that they're coming but I think you know I I once heard it said and it, I think it was by Mark Driscoll so I'll I'll be careful um, but he basically said he was talking to a, a missionary from India and you know he he was in India and he was you know at this place where they literally cut chickens head off and sacrificed them and sprinkled their blood and you know you know to to all these idols and you know mark pastor mark at the time was like you know how how can you say that that america you know needs needs you know the gospel when when this is clearly going on in your own country and and the guy said look dude uh you know in 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 our country, it's very clear where the idolatry is. In America, it's not so clear. You know, people are deceived. You know, you'll walk into the house and and you'll see as as an you know for him as a man from India, he'd walk into a house and see they have all their chairs uh, lined up in their living room pointed at the TV because the TV is their idol, or they have you know stadiums that they fill full of sixty thousand fans that are there to worship their favorite sports team, and so you know these are the kind of things that that we look at and call blessings, but in in reality sometimes they're not blessings blessings at all. And so uh, I, I do pray uh, specifically for God to bless America in the form of repentance and that he would lead Americans uh, to, to their knees uh, and in hopes that they could be saved. Um, let's see. Uh, Thomas weighed in and said, it's impossible for Muslims to have salvation because they deny the word on the cross for it is foolishness to them. Uh, and that's true. I mean, yeah, I'm certainly not trying to, I don't think anyone here tonight was trying to, to say that Muslims, uh, you know, are saved. They're not. They, they deny the Savior, and they deny the need for a Savior. And, and, and even, you know, one of the tenets of Muslim religion is that they can be good enough, right? And, and they come to God, and they beg, and they plead, you know, in their prayers five times a day that the Lord would have mercy on them. So there's some contriteness, uh, but, but God has sent his Son into the world to save all of humanity uh, from their sins. Uh, for those that put their faith and trust in him, uh, his blood is sufficient to cover it. And for those that reject him or deny them, they stand uh, in their own judgment uh, still as children of wrath. And so our hearts should break for Muslims and we should, we should share the truth with them as well. I think the point that we were trying to make is that even Muslims believe in Jesus, but that belief is not the kind of belief that leads to salvation. Uh, moving on, uh, another truth without regret is that God answers to no one. Everyone answers to God. 
And, and, you know, I, I, I've had a couple conversations over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I'm, I'm walking through, um, uh, through the Exodus. And so, uh, just getting through the plagues and just seeing how God, uh, repeatedly, uh, through Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and told him exactly what he was going to do unless Pharaoh repented. Um, you know, God offered mercy and then God offered his justice, right? And so, uh, you know, a lot of people, and I, I think I had an engagement with, with someone when I shared uh, one of those messages, uh, you know, and she weighed in and said, well, yeah, okay, uh, God says obey me or else. And, you know, really it broke my heart that that's where she went with it because it, I think it was the, it was the plague of the hail uh, specifically that I, that I was writing on where God, you know, literally said, Hey, if you desire to spare your, um, if you desire to spare your flocks, if you desire to spare your servants, then get them, uh, get them to shelter because I'm bringing hail. And unless they take cover, they're going to die and I'm going to destroy them. And I'm going to destroy everything that, that isn't under some kind of shelter. And those that had fear of the Lord, uh, received his mercy and they brought their servants in and they were protected. They brought their animals in and they were protected. Uh, for those that rejected or denied God, uh, you know, they, they got exactly what God said was coming and, and it was their choice to reject him. And so, you know, God didn't say, or obey me or else he basically said, obey me, uh, because I am going to do this. So it, it wasn't a punishment for not obeying. They chose their own punishment. And I think that that's what people need to understand is that God, God extends the gospel to everyone. Um, you know, the, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. That, that blood is sufficient for everyone who puts their faith, hope, and trust in Christ's finished work. Uh, there will be those that reject it. There will be those whose hearts are hardened uh, because they have rebelled and they have chosen sin over uh, submission. Um, but the, God's God's gift, God's gospel, uh, is for anyone that would put their hope, faith, and trust in Him. Um, and I think it's important that we understand that God doesn't answer to us. Like He is God, right? And I think a lot of times, you know, especially uh, in in a culture like America where we have you know, individual freedom, like nobody gets to be the boss of me. Right. And, and that, that kind of attitude, that kind of rebellion, uh, actually, uh, is a detriment to, to the gospel a lot of times because, um, you know, basically people say, well, not my God, or, you know, I got some, I got some things I need to say to God, if that's the way it is like, wow, you know, that kind of rebellion, that kind of, uh, uh, what's defiance or just, disrespect like we're literally talking about the creator of the universe and you think that he answers to you uh you know read job <laughs> you know god let job get away with some complaining uh and then in chapter 40 he went on to just say look dude were you there were you there when i created the world were you there when i told the the hail and the storehouses uh you know when to to drop their you know their store you know and and i think you know it is an arrogance. Ron, Ron just said it's arrogant, and that's exactly what it is. It's an arrogance that leads us to believe that God answers to us. And and the reality is that God does not answer to anyone. God is God. God is sovereign. And the other reality is that everyone answers to God. Uh, we will all stand before him uh, on Judgment Day. And the question isn't whether or not uh, you know, he's in charge. The question is whether or not his son's blood has covered our sins and whether or not we have, we have submitted uh, and repented and put our faith and trust in him. Uh, moving on, uh, th- this, this is a really cool one. Actually, this came from a post that I had made uh, several years back, but I just tried to, you know, recycle it because I thought it was a good truth. And it was this spiritual victory is a byproduct of, of obedience. Submission to God's word and will is what will lead you to joy in Christ, while also keeping you humble with the reminder that victory is impossible without him. You know, I think a lot of times because the gospel is free, is a free gift, 
we tend to forget that there's still a component there where we need to walk in obedience, right? Uh, you know, when, when you say yes to Jesus, that doesn't mean that you get to reject the commandments, right? Like God's commandments are, are still for us, right? God, Jesus said he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And he did fulfill the law because no man could. None of us could live up to the demands of the commandments. But Jesus didn't come to wipe out the commandments. He came to fulfill the commandments. And so we still need to understand that even as Christians, we have an obligation to walk in submission and obedience, and that our spiritual victories are going to come as a natural byproduct of our obedience. So when we say yes to the will uh, of God, when we say yes to what his word says, uh, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, even when we don't personally find the strength within ourselves to do it, but we lean into the power of the Holy Spirit, as we say yes to those things, we'll begin to see fruit in our lives. Um, regardless of the results, right? Uh, God doesn't judge us based on results. He judges us based on an obedient heart, right? Uh, a lot of times results are not up to us, right? Like we we can only do so much. There's only so many things that we can control. But what we one thing that we can control is whether or not we will submit to God's word and walk in submission to his word. Uh, we only got a couple minutes left, so I want to I want to jump into the, some of the things that we put out just today. <laughs> um, uh, it's a grave mistake to misconstrue God's patience towards sinners or His forbearance towards sin for indifference. Every man will reap what he sows. Some men to their eternal damnation, and others to their eternal joy. Uh, the Bible says, "Do not be deceived. God is not mocked." For whatever one sows, that will he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. That's Galatians 6, uh, verses 7 and 8. And really the point there in that truth is that uh, there's a lot of people that say, well, w- where's God? You know, I mean... I just did this choice or I just did that choice and they're, you know, they were, they were sinful, but there didn't seem to be any punishment or consequence for it. So maybe God really doesn't care that much, right? I've been living with my girlfriend for three months and, and yes, we're having, you know, uh, premarital sex. Yes, we're fornicating together, but God doesn't seem to mind. It's not like he struck me with a lightning bolt. So maybe he just really doesn't care that much. And, and I think that kind of attitude that kind of blatant disregard for what we know to be true about God's word uh, is not actually a good for us. In fact, sometimes that's the fruits of the flesh, right? And so you're you're sowing to the flesh and you will reap what you sow, right? And so when you sow to the flesh, your flesh is going to reap uh, corruption. And part of that corruption, I think, is simply the fact that we become to f- we become kind of callous to our own sin and, you know, if we're saved, God's going to discipline us because he loves us and he's going to draw us back into, into uh, fellowship with him. But uh, for a lot of people, it's actually the evidence that they aren't even saved. And so don't pretend for a minute that God doesn't care about sin. Uh, Jesus died because God cares about sin. Uh, The Bible is very clear that Jesus was the propitiation for sin because God cares uh, very, very much about sin, and he will hold sinners accountable for their sin. Uh, Maybe lastly here, uh, one of the most dangerous choices a person can make is to compare the good, or uh, let me say that again because I screwed it up. Uh, One of the most dangerous choices a person can make is to compare the God of Scripture with the God man has created in order to gratify his own sinful desires. And uh, we see this all the time. Uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, people will say, oh, well, not my God. Like, my God wouldn't do that. My God wouldn't punish someone just because they're gay. My God wouldn't punish someone just because they, you know, were born a man, but now they're living as a woman. Not my God. My God's loving. Well, what God? Like, what God are you talking about? Like, when you say my God, like, tell me what you mean by that, right? Because a lot of times what people say, you know, when people say not my God, really what they're talking about is some kind of God that they created in their own mind. It's not the God of Scripture, right? They've rejected the God of Scripture because most of the time 
people are bringing uh, the word of God to the conversation and saying, this is what God says. And the, the natural inclination is for people to say, well, not my God. My God wouldn't do that. Uh, well, first of all, your God is fake. Uh, your God doesn't exist. Your God is likely yourself. Uh, and you answer to him uh, only so much as, you know, he gratifies your own sinful desires, right? Or allows you to walk in your sinful desires without giving you any conviction for them. Uh, but that is not the God of Scripture. And so it's very important for us as Christians to make a distinction between the God of Scripture and the gods that men have created in their own minds and in their own image so that they can walk in their own sinful desires. Uh, the world's definition of God uh, will not line up with the biblical definition of God. Certainly the culture, right? Like the godless culture and their definition of what a good God is, is not going to be uh, the God of Scripture. But the problem is that that if Christians embrace this concept, we're doing a serious disservice to the world. The world needs to know that they will answer to God. They will answer to the God of Scripture whether they have submitted to him and put their trust and faith in him or whether they have rejected him and rebelled against him. We will all stand before the God of Scripture and give an account for our life. And so it's important for us as Christians not to play silly games or even allow people to do so unchecked. Like if we love people, we tell them the truth and we tell them the truth without regrets. And the truth is that the God of Scripture is the God that we need to be concerned about. The God of Scripture is the God that, that every man, woman, and child that has ever lived on this earth needs to care seriously about and as Christians, that's the kind of God that we need to speak of, that you know, we need to speak of his character without regrets. We need to share his truth without feeling bad about it. Uh, we need to um, understand that, that God, is, uh, God has a standard, and not only does God have a standard, God sets the standard, and that God will hold everybody accountable to that standard, and that unless they uh, put their faith, trust, and hope in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross on their behalf and, and then choose to say yes and carry their cross daily uh, and, and follow him, then they will stand before him on judgment day and he will say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And, and so it's important for Christians to understand the, the words that we say about God matter. The way that we convey God and, and the message of the gospel to others matters dramatically. And, and the culture has a God in their mind that they're willing to embrace. And it's the kind of God that, that creates gay people. It's the kind of God that celebrates gay people. It's the kind of God that celebrates fornication and sexual, uh, you know, uh, sexual sin. It's the kind of God that, that doesn't care about greed. It's the kind of God that doesn't care about divorce or broken families. It's the kind of God that doesn't care about anger. It's the kind of God that doesn't care about the countless amounts of other sins that we have embraced and just said it's not that big of a deal. That's the kind of God that the culture will embrace. The kind of God that, that the culture will reject is the one true God, the God of Scripture, the God that we find in the Bible, the God that tells us what the standard of good actually is and that tells us what evil is and the kind of God that tells us he will hold us accountable if we reject him and choose sin. That's the God the culture won't embrace, but that's the God that they will stand before on Judgment Day. And unless we speak of that God boldly, and as, unless we speak of his truth without regretting it or having any kind of shame in our hearts, then the gospel has lost its power. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, we're, we're about five minutes over already. Um, you know, I could go on and on probably, and I'm, I'm thankful for, for all the engagement tonight because it's really helped, uh, you know, us have a, a decent conversation. Um, let me see if there's some comments here that we can end on. Uh, let's see. Thomas said regarding their God, uh, their God is the person in the bathroom mirror in the morning. Correct. Yeah. Their God is themselves most likely, right? They're trying to gratify the, the, 
the sins of their own heart, right? And 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 but by the grace of God go I, right? So so I don't say that in judgment. Like I was that guy. Like I answered to no one other than myself until I realized that I answered to the God of Scripture, and by His grace uh, I am saved, and by His grace alone. Um, Ron says, I am who I am. That is Yahweh. That's right. And and that's what he told Moses, right? Uh, if they ask who who sent you, you tell them I am. Tell them I am sent you. And and even Jesus, right? Like he wasn't he wasn't really accused of blasphemy until he said, I am, right? Before Abraham was, I am. They knew exactly what he was saying in that statement, and they hung him on a tree because they did not believe he was who he said he was. The problem is Jesus is who he says he is, and that that's wonderful for us. Uh, that's that's great news for those who put their faith, hope, and trust in him and his finished work on the cross. That is terribly frightening news uh, for anyone who chooses to reject Jesus because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. Uh, pilgrims, these are the kind of words that people need to hear from us. These are the kind of things that that people need to know. They need to to hear them from our mouths, and we need to speak them in the kind of way that's going to to be bold. That's going to push back against the uh, ideologies of of a culture, uh, and and it should sting. Uh, the kind of truths that Christians bring are the kind of truths that 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 run contradictory to to the things of culture, and culture needs to be woken up. Uh, from their slumber, from their sinfulness, from their godlessness. And the only way that the culture is going to be woken up from their godlessness is if Christians own our responsibility to be ambassadors for Christ and we live boldly. And so my challenge to you as you enter into 2023, my challenge for myself is whether it's Facebook, whether it's conversations that you're having with your friends or family, stand firm on the truth of God's word. Do not be ashamed of it. I, I love the passage in Scripture where Paul says, uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power unto salvation. Don't be ashamed, pilgrims. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be embarrassed by the gospel. The gospel is the power unto salvation. And unless we are sharing that truth, how will they know? How will they know unless they are told? And how will they be told unless we are sent and unless we take uh, our formal command given to us by Jesus before he ascended into heaven, where he said, go and make disciples, teaching them, you know, all that I have taught you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Like, like that is our obligation. That's our command given to us. And we need to walk boldly. We need to walk in confidence and we need to walk and understand that the gospel the gospel, the truth of the gospel is the power to salvation. Uh, and, and only through the gospel can people find true peace, true freedom, true joy, true happiness, and truly find the Savior. So remember that. Uh, like we always say here, remember that there is a perishing world out there. So do your part, pilgrims, to ensure that they're hearing the truth. God bless you. Stay patient. We love you guys. Praying for you guys. We appreciate you guys. And we'll see you back here next week.